it now or in, no? Excellent, okay, here we go. Hello everyone. Quite recently, I got in my hands a notebook. A notebook coming probably from some embedded project. It was as a diary of someone who was, in my opinion, a security expert in that project. I looked into the deep. I told myself it's a great material to talk about the best practices in choosing software for your embedded product. I'm pretty sure nobody of you worked on that specific product. So if the stories look familiar, it is not your product. Okay? Each project starts on day one, right? So let's see what we have on day one. The project started. I got the list of components. The BSP uses the kernel 2.6. <laughs> yeah. We sometimes start projects from scratch and choosing the components from ground up. But that is the minority of cases from my experience. Usually you either are building on top of some existing project with some existing hardware support or there is some component to use in that specific project or, especially those days, there is something the procuring team can actually buy. So, you have some system on chip that is there from the beginning. And what do a security person start from in this case? Asking a lot of questions. Is the socket self support integrated in the Linux mainline? Is it? Does it have correct device trees? And then we'll start looking to the quality of that code itself. There's the socket self, there are peripherals in that sock, and the same type of questions. Do they have upstream drivers? Or there's some vendor non-steam driver somewhere in some tar file that was delivered um, one day. Then for which version does it work? And just a short look at the file gives us a hint on the quality. There's the code itself the SOC support itself, but also the integration. Integration in distributions, all the distribution building system. What I like to ask as a question, is there a well-supported Yocto layer for this specific BSP? And the first quality check, does it pass the Yocto check layer. If answers to all those questions are mostly negative, time to go find some other chip and convince everyone that uh, the new one is exactly what they need to have. At day one. <laughs> Yeah, you have the chip. Um, of course, you repeat the same thing uh, for all the external chips like the Wi-Fi and, and everything else. You got the idea. But also you have the features 
that the project, the product is going to have. I'm a networking person, so I'm looking at networking first. We like to have network protocols and uh, do all the network protocols in this project have encryption and authentication. If TLS, if it's TLS 1.2 or TLS 1.3, something else, try to remove it. And then quite many devices those days, they do have cloud functions. If you have cloud functions, you will be quite often also in the data privacy regulation space. So go to talk, go and talk to lawyers. But from the security point of view, first big question is, are you going to transfer user data somewhere? If yes, how we are going to protect it? Big question to ask and not hesitate to ask difficult questions at this stage. <laughs> then the project usually has some libraries or APIs that are must have for one reason or another. So verifying what this is in your product, project useful from the beginning. And then the final question that isn't that easy is how your product, how long your product is going to be supported. Probably there will be some idea at the beginning, but how long, it could change during the lifetime. It could change because, because of some regulations. So think about in practice, how long you are going to support the whole thing and write the number of years in a well, well visible place because we'll need it a lot at different stages. And one small side note here about the vocabulary I use about maintained and supported. It, those are synonyms. How I use them through this presentation is maintained means, we, we talk about maintained projects. Maintained project is a project where someone, someone is taking care of the project. Someone is accepting user requests, some bugs, uh, pull requests. There's some activity. And then you have a supported version. Supported version is the, a version that actually gets updates. Me, mostly interested by security updates, but also bug fixes. And this is usually for a limited period of time only. So what you may have, you may have a well-maintained project that you use, but you use a completely unsupported version. Of course, something to avoid. Or you may be using an unsupported version of a non-maintained project. And that we try to avoid. Okay, let's go back to our diary. Day three. This is the second day discussing the distribution to use. Currently, the most popular option is not to use any at all. What I was thinking is that they probably decided to grab a few packages from the internet, compile them and just drop on the device, right? My answer to that, say no to do it yourself, especially when choosing distributions. Why? Uh, because then you maintain it and you support it, basically. So when choosing a distribution, my first question is how they support it. So how frequently do you get security updates? 
that's the question one. Question zero is, do they have security updates? And then how, how frequent the security updates are? Are there known long-standing security issues? It's also an interesting question to ask. And usually at this moment, people start to hide. Then how long is the version supported? And then you go back to day one and see for how long you are going to support your project. And you check if those two ranges actually match each other. And of course, uh, the related question is if the distribution has a long time support version or not. If it has, normally it means it will be supported for a little bit longer. Take into account that if your product is going to be supported longer than the distribution supports this long term support version, what it means, you are going to maintain it later. Yeah! On the binary or source distribution, it depends. It depends on quite many things. So if you are using source, you have a choice, for example, to use the Yocto project on the related distributions of Bidroot. On binary, I have seen quite many people using Debian on Ubuntu, Ubuntu especially in the robotics space. So let's get an example of how we analyze of what we see. This is an extract of the Yocto project uh, releases page. So what we can see here, um, we have two LTS versions done for Kirkstone, um, and we have an upcoming new version uh, that will be out. And if you are familiar with this wiki page, there are all the releases in between Dunfall and Kirkstone. They are not supported anymore, means no security fixes whatsoever. If you have a product running one of them, uh, do something. For a new product, what would be the choice to take those days? If you have already something in development for running, running down for, that's okay to keep it and at least until 24. That should be okay for, for the security updates. But if you are starting right now, I would rather recommend you to go uh, with Kirkstone if you want to release rapidly. And if you have courage to follow the Yocto Master, not go to the with the latest version that will be just supported for some time, but just follow, follow the master. Uh, until the next LTS. Personal recommendations at this stage. Okay. Let's come back to another entry. Day 17. Today only five new layers appeared. This is better than yesterday. Uh, I would assume that it came with Yocto. What is the very good point of the Yocta project that it's easy to add layers? What is less liked by the security people and the maintenance people that it's harder to remove stuff that you do not actually need. So my advice for everyone adding layers or thinking about adding layers, layers is to First, ask yourself a question, do I actually need it? And then look at the quality, at if it's Yocto project compatible, in this case, less problems uh, on your way. And of course, is it maintained? Now, let's have an example. Someone wanted to include something that included MetaSecure call. So the first analysis um, is on GitHub, but a glitch, it looks 
like a personal project of someone when you look at the GitHub link, right? So this is not a very good sign because what happens if that person moves away? It means that there's no direct uh, assignment to, to an organization. It could be problematic. So a warning sign. Then we look at the statistics of the, of the project itself. So at the number of commits, oh, the clicker doesn't want to, uh, you have hundreds of commits here. Um, you have quite many folks, you have quite many stars on GitHub, uh, and from all the sources, we know that it's pretty used layer in the area. So this is something acceptable with a warning that if something happens to the maintainer, uh, it may be your problem. Another way of evaluating projects, certain programs, uh, the best practices badge from OpenSSF, it gives you a number of criteria on different areas related to quality and security in general. Projects can get badges, you have uh, passing and you can get silver on gold level, depending on the criteria they pass. The project itself needs to apply for the badge. They need to film a form, give the information um, to, uh, to fulfill the criteria. And let's have a look at uh, some of the criteria. For example, it says that you need to have a bug, um, you may ha must have a process to, uh, for the users to submit bugs. Quite obvious, but, uh, but necessary. And you, the project should be tracking individual issues as individual bugs, okay, but also the project must acknowledge a majority of bugs submitted in the last two to 12 months. Interesting. At least acknowledge bugs that they are here, maybe not actually act on it. My personal feedback on using best practices, it's a, it's a very useful tool because some of the information that is there is not available anywhere else in an easy to, to grab form. For example, there are questions about the static analysis tools and I do not know any place other than that where you can just look if that specific project uses static analysis and how it uses it. So it's very rich um, database of information and more than 5,000 projects those days. Okay, let's come back. We are day 27. I said no to adding one small component. Checked. It was bringing eight new libraries. Yeah. Unfortunately, that is something that happens. One component bringing components that are bringing components. And I have a question. Yeah, this is a day of hard questions. Do you know how many components there are in your project? Maybe, maybe you have an idea. If you don't, what can you do? If I, or if you are not sure, what you can, what can you do? Generate package list from uh, from your project and check it from time to time. The package list doubling in size in uh, one day is a bad sign. Then, uh, if you are using Yocto project, there are a few useful tools that you can have, especially if you are monitoring from uh, CI run to CI run. 
by bit back minus G with the dependency graph. Uh, security people love looking at dependency graph and getting headache uh, after analyzing what they see. Uh, then the CV check giving you the non-security issues in your in your image, also diffing when possible, and the created SPDX for the for the S bomb. Three useful tools to have when um, when looking at what you actually have in your project. Let's go to some examples, maybe. So I was looking over my morning coffee on the on the fresh package list, and there was lib micro httpd. Mm -hmm. Looks like a web server. And um, where does it come from? And not only this, there were some ex unexpected crypto libraries after I have been working for some time to remove the crypto libraries uh, that we do not use. So what's going on? I'm not putting the whole dependency chain because it's it's a bit more complex. The crypto libs were used by lib micro httpd that was uh, brought in by, by debug and 4 d that came from lfutils. Okay. Okay, asking around, does anyone use it in the project? No? Okay, Gets, let's get rid of it. And how easy? It's really easy uh, when you know what you want to remove. In this case, it's one configuration option in elf utils that you need to remove, and in the recipe, um, uh, in the Yocto, it's all already prepared. You just need to remove one distro feature. Done. Removed. All this gone. And if you have analyzed the dependency chain, you manage to remove things. Most of the time I'm spending as a security person is actually on analyzing the de dependency chains and finding out uh, why it shows up here and if we can actually remove it. And one more example, a pretty recent one. Um, the Neuro project works on enabling uh, SBOM generation by default all the time. That, we can say that was, it was a little bit of an um, interesting ride, especially with some less frequently used layers like MetaZephyr, uh, but all fixes are out, let's say a little bit work around it in some places, but still it works. You can watch quite many talks at this conference talking about generating SBOM. But um, what we decided to do is to go uh, one step further to actually use the SBOM. Yeah, use the SBOM. So we gave the SBOM to lawyers, to the IP compliance check. And uh, as a result, we have a nice discussion uh, started yesterday on the Yocto project mailing list because um, they found out that they are that they are a few things mit missing uh, in the reporting so they cannot do the um, composition analysis uh, as they would they would uh, like to do but there are a lot of ways to apparently to get the missing information so it's a pretty exciting and nice uh, use case of um, of s bombs and actually uh, using them using them in practice. So I'm pretty interested to see how it ends up and what we are going to add uh, so that this particular use case uh, is satisfied. Okay, let's go now back to the diary. We are day 79. Finally, a discussion on updates. I asked from day 11. Updates, three months in the project, uh, I would say 
It should be like that. It should be like that because it's critical. I will be very verbatim here, updates are critical because even the best design project with best people, there will be bugs. And when the device is deployed, an update is probably the only way you can remove the problem, other than the destroying the device, of course. So, I'm not telling you which update system to use, I'm telling you to look into the scope of the system you are looking into. Does it allow you to update the firmware? And which firmware? If they are, they may be the SOC firmware, they may be firmware for some Wi-Fi or some other, uh, other elements that you have. Does it allow you to update bootloaders? Because updating bootloaders is typically a pretty tricky thing. And you need to prepare for both update of firmware and update of bootloaders. If you start adding it late in the process, this is going to be complex. And of course, the two other things, updating the kernel applications and of course the file system. Yeah, quite many things that we need to consider when updating and early, as early as possible. And then we come to the, yeah, that is the last entry in the diary. Day 97. Two weeks to the release. <laughs> and there is some name that I couldn't read. Wants to try adding secure boot. To that, I will answer. Okay, first, I will answer that we do not do it two weeks before the release. And then I will answer it with a citation. Do or do not, do not try, especially with secure boot. So, secure boot is added for a number of reasons. Some of them are very good reasons. Some of them have other solutions. Examples, you can be adding secure boot because you want to protect the device from accidental removal of keys, that something bad happens and the keys just disappear. You may want to encrypt user data because it's some confidential, um, confidential information in there. Uh, but you may want to also protect against uh, a little way more sophisticated things like someone resoldering the EMMC or flash on the card and putting a malicious software instead. Or you may have an application uh, typically in, um, in the T that, uh, that must not be changed. Protecting against so resolded flash or, uh, for example, it's a very good case to actually do the full uh, complete secure boot. If you want to just protect your for some accident and not really from malicious users, there are easier things that you can do. Do not need to bring, um, bring a secure boot that is not that easy to put in place. My advice summarized on one slide. <laughs> um, it's very easy to build secure boot broken from the beginning. It's a chain, it's not just an added package you add somewhere. Unfortunately, those days people are working to make it easier, but it's still a little bit complex and requires understanding on different elements of the chain and how they interact with each other. It needs to be taken into account early for quite many different things like partitioning the updates. I was at the previous talk about Delta updates and I was thinking, okay, secure boot on with the Delta updates on all the recalculations that you need to do. Uh, for this to work uh, cool. 
Um, and you have the key. You have the key on multiple keys and the big question of user keys on the machine, um, machine owner's key. If you are going to have it and how, how it's going to work. If there is a reference implementation for your platform and you want to implement Secure Boot, start from the reference implementation. And at the last point, I'm not joking, that is really what I uh, strongly recommend. If you implement Secure Boot, get an external audit. It's too easy to make it wrong, use the wrong key, um, or just forget to initialize something. Uh, very easy to just miss it and then your whole secure boot chain, it doesn't work. So it doesn't make sense to let that kind of an easy error to pass through. I don't know how this project has ended. It ends, the diary ends at the, at the secure boot. So, you understand now why I was thinking that nobody is you, of you was working on that project. Even if you were, keep it to yourself. <laughs> there are way more stories we can find from this project and another, I think. For the part two, for the sequel, uh, we have the setting up of network protocols, especially do-it-yourself network protocols. That is especially cool. Uh, and protocols without encryption, even better. We have how to update bot support packages, how to we back bot security patches, and what happens if it goes wrong. And we have the security response team. So a lot of material for part two. But now for the part one, my takeaways. Security depends on most of the decisions you take in the project and the choice of different components you have in the project. Evaluating the software is absolutely the key to everything. And the first question to ask yourself before adding anything, do I need it? And the second one is, um, does it have security updates? Mm, I also recommend you to have a look at the um, guide on evaluating open source software just released by the Open uh, Source Security Foundation. Uh, as a full disclosure, I'm one of the co-authors and that is not the only reason why I recommend it. It, it contains a nice list of questions to ask yourself for each, sing each single package it contains. And that will be time for questions. We have a mic in the middle. If you would like to ask something, don't hesitate. Or we, you can ask just, just like that. We'll try to repeat the question. Yeah, we have the first one. <laughs> yeah, uh, somebody has to start. Yeah. Uh, so, if I got you right, then you said that um, the Yocto project does a lot of stuff quite well. Please tell us what we are doing not well, where we should get better. Um, yeah, I prefer to telling about things that are done well. Because if I say that enough, uh, then people will, s will keep doing that and won't change their mind. So that's already a very good thing. Uh, then about the things that, uh, that maybe could have um, some other outcome. Um, I've talked about the, the difficulty to find out what you do not need and the analysis of dependencies of having some packages that come from some somewhere and try to figure out where it comes from and why. So this is something um, that could be uh, that could be uh, that could, could be worked on. 
Um, the Yocto project also quite good on fixing CVs. It's pretty, uh, that is working pretty nicely. More people working on the, on the CVEs, that will be good. And also, um, I've noticed when I was working on analyzing the gaps in the CV process of the Yocto project, I found that there are some gaps like the CPEs that are not set correctly, uh, found things like um, mismatch between the CV that was actually fixed and uh, that was marked as fixed. There are things like that, apart from just fixing CVs, working on um, the general, um, general security flow. I know there is Armin working on that. Um, what I would love to see is see the meta hardening layer being transferred, transformed into a distro feature. That's my uh, uh, project on my to-do list for a long time. <laughs> Never managed to do uh, the add hardening, actually um, hardening options to quite many uh, packages just from the beginning that you can have them configured correctly as it is. Because the default configuration as you bring the, um, the image, it's not ideal from the software point of view if someone just flashes it to a production device. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as I understood, the, uh, the whole presentation is taking care about the product itself. So are there any do's and don'ts and recommendations about the infrastructure that surrounds it? Oh, you mean the, the CI, the, the cloud, and... Uh, yeah, and when it comes to security specifically, so secret management, all these aspects. Uh, I'm, between, uh, I'm between you and the lunch. Do you really want me to answer this <laughs> question? <laughs> Um, so, those days, I think the big challenge that we have is the use of cloud in embedded. Because um, there, are, there are a few reasons for that. There's the reason uh, related to the um, supply chain attacks. If you start putting containers from the internet, it may happen that what you download is not exactly what you were expecting to download. So all the verification of what you are downloading from the internet, uh, we have, we need, yeah, we need to, for, 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 we need may, maybe not tools, but to be aware that all those attacks exist. So there may be attacks on the software, you may get uh, just malicious software on your container. And there is the whole thing related to data protection. It's so easy to send a um, stream of user data when, you are, when, you, when your device is a camera, send the, the stream of the user data somewhere. And that's a big challenge. And I think I've seen the red card already, so I need to stop at this point. We can talk later on. Thank you.